morning, everyone, and welcome back to another day of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the educators here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and I'm so excited to join you or for you to join us exploring this amazing habitat. So we're going to talk all about coral reefs today. Now, we're going to talk about what a coral reef is, and then we're going to zoom in really close, take a close look at coral, and then we'll look at some of the animals who live there. Now, before we get started, if you would like to participate today, we would love to hear from you. So I've got my friend Sergio, and he just put up our text line. So you can text us at 562-286-1838. Now that's if you're watching live. So it's Monday morning at 9 a.m. on August 28th. Now if you're watching after the fact, we'd still love to hear from you, hear your questions, be able to answer them. But we ask that you email us at live at lbaop.org. All right, everyone, are you ready to get started? So I'm going to step off the screen for a moment, and we're going to start to make some observations. Now, if you've joined us for any program before, you know we talk about observations a lot. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. I like to use observations. They're a tool that scientists use. And what I think is great about observations is you may never have even heard of the thing you're observing, in this case, the coral reef. It may be a brand new habitat, a brand new home that you've never learned anything before, and you can still be a scientist and make observations. Because the way we make observations is just looking at something and describing what we see. And that actually helps us learn about it. So even if you know tons of things about coral reef, or you know nothing, you can still make those observations. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to take a look at this habitat. Now this is here at the aquarium. We have cameras in a lot of our exhibits, and so you can check in on our animals pretty much at any time. If you look at night, it might be a little dark because we do turn off the lights for our animals, but you can check in on our animals and see what's happening. And it also makes a great way for us to make some observations of this habitat. Now, if you would like to share those observations, you can of course text us, as I mentioned, that text line is 562-286-1838. You can just think those observations in your brain. You can write them down. You can share them if you're watching with a friend or if you're in class or with an adult or with a pet, you can share those observations with anyone around you. But let's start to think, what do we notice about this habitat? Now, observations can be colors. Do you see any colors you recognize? I see lots of colors, which making the observation that this is a pretty colorful place is a really good one because coral reefs are known for having lots of different colors and patterns and designs and lots of things going on. And we see the colors not only in the animals, but also part of the structures that build that habitat as well. So I notice there's some green right here and even some yellow. Oh, and there's this fish right here has yellow on its body too. I notice all the way over here is some red. And then there's a little bit of red all the way up here. And then there's some, ooh, there's some purple right here and more green and kind of orange. So lots and lots of colors to observe. What else do you notice? Observations could be shapes of things. They can be both living things and non-living things. So I see lots of fish in here, lots of animals. But I also see some rocks and some things that kind of look like rocks, but maybe we'll talk a little bit more about whether they actually are rocks, and that is the coral itself. Oh, I see a really slow moving fish coming right in front of our camera. Oh, and right above it, I see a stingray. So observations could be behaviors too. So we notice these fish are swimming. Some swim right across our screen. Some were going up, some might be going down. So the direction, the way they're moving can be an observation. The way they swim, check out this stingray coming towards us. This is called a cow nose ray. And watch how it's swimming compared to this fish right here. Now they're both using fins, but we can notice they move in different ways. Now that stingray kind of flaps its fins, almost like wings. Can you flap your fins or wings like a stingray, like you're swimming through? Oh, there's, oh, right here, coming another stingray, right above us. So they kind of flap their wings or their fins up and down while you swim. Whereas our fish have the little tiny fins, and they don't so much flap them as kind of move them back and forth. What other observations can we make? Now, I notice that some of the fish are swimming and some are kind of hanging out. If you take a look over here, we've got one little fish kind of just hanging out on this coral right here. So some fish move a lot. Some don't move that much. They kind of hang out, maybe taking a little rest, a little snooze. Oh, hello fish. Now take a look at this fish. 
came right in front of our camera. Did you notice anything interesting about the shape of its body? You may have noticed that horn. Now, if you were going to describe that fish or give it a name, what would you call it? Would you call it a unicorn fish? Is that what you said? Well, that's what that fish's name is. It's called a unicorn fish. So anytime anyone tells you that unicorns aren't real, you can just tell them they actually live in the ocean. They're a fish. We've got lots of unicorn fish living in our tropical reef here. Now, those are some amazing observations. Now, you can keep making observations, and if you want to share them, go ahead and text us. Oh, there's our unicorn fish again. Sometimes our fish really like being in front of the camera. They can see the cameras there. It's a small camera and then it has a glass casing around it to protect it. And they can see the reflection in it. So they know it's there. Some fish really like to be right in front of the camera, some less so. But our, see, it looks like our unicorn fish is enjoying the spotlight this morning. So you can keep making observations and text us. But what I want to start to do is kind of break down what makes up this habitat. So we've got all these animals living in this space here. And you can see there's a lot of rocks. But what really makes up this habitat is the coral. So the rock is important because the coral is going to attach to the rocks. But let's focus in on coral. Now, you can see the coral right here and right here and right there. The coral in here is artificial. So it's not live coral. And that is because this is a huge exhibit. This is our largest exhibit here at the aquarium. And to fill this huge exhibit with live coral would mean we would need to take a lot of coral from the ocean. And that is not something that we felt comfortable doing. And so we found a company who makes the coral that looks exactly like live coral would, but they just make it out of like a plastic material. And then we put it into our exhibit and our animals, they don't really know the difference. They treat it the same way they would live coral. So they might hide in it. They'll eat food off of it. They might lay their eggs in it. And so we can feel comfortable not taking coral from their natural habitat to build this exhibit, but still displaying what coral looks like. But if we think about coral itself, I have a question for you. What is coral? Now, if you've been here at the aquarium and you've gone up to our tropical gallery, you may have heard this question before. Is coral a rock? Is it a plant or is it an animal? Now, sometimes it looks like all three of those things. I'm going to have Sergio put us into one of our other little videos of coral. Excellent. So take a look here. This is a smaller exhibit that we have here at the aquarium. Now, this is a video recording, so this isn't live, but this is live coral. So the coral in here is real coral as opposed to that artificial coral in that other large exhibit. And if you take a look here, here is an example where it kind of looks like it could be all three of those things. It could be a rock, it could be a plant, it could be an animal. Because if you look over here at this piece of coral right here, is it moving a lot? Not really, it doesn't really move at all. But then if you look at this coral right here, because this is also coral, you'll notice it's got some movement to it. It's kind of flexible and it's moving in the current of the water. So coral can look like a lot of different things. But if you said coral is an animal, you are correct. Now corals, are a what we call a colonial animal. And what that means is they, it's a bunch of tiny, tiny animals all living together. Think about an apartment complex. Now, maybe you live in an apartment or you've seen an apartment building before where there's a bunch of different units. So I live in an apartment and it's just me, but then I have neighbors who live in another apartment, but it's all the same building. And that's pretty much what coral is. So if you take a look here, these are what we call coral polyps. So all these little stalks with the little fringes at the top that is an individual polyp, that's one animal, but they all live together. So if I'm looking at this, it might, you might think that's all one animal altogether, but it's actually a bunch of tiny animals. Now we could count them, but we'd be here for a while counting all those different individual polyps. But they all live together to create the one structure. So coral is a colonial animal, it's a bunch of tiny animals that live together. And these are called their coral polyps. So they're kind of this fringy looking thing. You may think um, if you've heard of an anemone, it's another type of animal, it might look familiar. Uh, and that's because they are relatives of anemones. Now anemones are local to us here in Southern California. We can see them at the tide pools and they look like this, just a bit bigger. And when you touch them, they're kind of sticky. Excellent. So this is a picture of a big anemone. This anemone would probably be about this big, whereas those polyps are going to be really tiny. This anemone can be really big. And these anemones, if you touch those tentacles, they might feel sticky. 
Now that's because they actually have stinging tentacles or stinging cells in those tentacles. And that's how they're able to catch their food. So we can touch them because the sting isn't that strong, but for a thing like a shrimp or a fish with a thin layer of scales, if they swim through the tentacles of the anemone, they'll get stung. So if we go back to the polyps, you'll notice they look very similar and they act in the same way. So these polyps, they can sting as well, and that's how they can catch some of their food. Now, you might wonder if these are really, really tiny, what kind of food they're catching. So they're gonna catch whatever kind of food floats by them. Anything, we call it plankton, things that drift by. So it could be teeny tiny little animals or teeny tiny little bits of plants, and they're gonna drift by, and these polyps are gonna catch those. They're gonna eat them. It's gonna give them energy, and then they're gonna be able to grow this structure around them, and that's what builds those pieces of coral. However, there's a catch there. For these corals, they live in tropical waters. And tropical waters are those really warm waters that are often very clear. So if you look down in the water, you can see a lot in there. But in clear water, there's not a lot of plankton floating around. Now, if you live here in Southern California and you go out to the beach, our water, not very clear. And that's because there's a lot of, we call it sediment, a lot of sand and other things kind of floating in the water. So that means there's actually a lot of food in the water to feed other animals. But in tropical waters, there's less tiny things floating around. And so that means that even though these polyps can catch their food, there's not a lot of food to catch them. So they have a little helper. So I'm gonna have Sergio put up another picture of a polyp. It's gonna be an even closer look. Excellent. So here you can see these polyps and they've got these little patterns in them and their little tentacles and they're catching the food. But inside each of these polyps is another friend called zooxanthellae. Now that is a really big word, but what zooxanthellae is, is it's a kind of algae. Here we go, this is a great picture. So you can see this polyp, those same tentacles, but check out all these sort of greenish yellow polka dots. That is all that algae. Now algae is kind of like a plant and one of the big similarities between algae and plants are that they photosynthesize. And what that means is they use the sunlight when it shines down on them and there's a chemical reaction in their body that helps them get energy. So they use the sunlight basically to get their food and it gives them energy. And so these polyps, they eat in two ways. They'll try and sting whatever particles float by with their tentacles, but that doesn't give them enough energy to survive. And so they also use that photosynthetic algae, that algae who's gonna use the sun. And in the tropical places, there's a lot of sunlight. And with that clear water, the sun's able to reach the corals really well and it helps them get extra energy to help them grow. Now, I have some coral over here at my document camera. These corals aren't alive anymore. And so what you'll see is they turn white. When that zooxanthellae, when that algae is no longer in the coral, the coral loses their color. So that's another thing that algae does. Not only does it help the coral get energy to grow, but it also gives coral its bright, bright colors. And we see corals in all different colors. But when the algae is no longer in the coral, it bleaches it and it turns it white. But you can see here, there's a variety of corals. Now these are just four different types of corals, but there are hundreds of different types of corals. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna zoom in on a couple of them so we can see all those little places where the polyps grow. So take a look, this is one kind of coral. So each of these little circles is where one polyp would live. And if I zoom in, you'll be able to see them even better. Take a look. So each of these little spaces is where one polyp lives and grows. And then together, they create this whole structure to build this piece of coral. And then we call them reef building corals because they build all together. And then another type of coral like this one maybe will grow right next to it or on top of it. And they create this wall of coral and that's how we get a coral reef. All right, let's take a look at a different coral. So this one is more of a branching coral because you can see kind of branches out, there's all these different stalks to it. But if we go really close, you'll see all these tiny polka dots, all these little holes, and these are where all these polyps will live. So these are different kinds of coral, so we'll have different kinds of polyps, but check out how tiny these little holes are. But that is where all the little polyps for this coral live, and then they grow and they build this structure, and we get these branching corals. So corals are really, really fascinating animal because it does look like a rock. Sometimes it looks like a plant. We've got another one here, but really it is a living animal. Now this one is called a tongue coral. Can you tell why we call it a tongue coral? Yeah, it kind of looks like a tongue, right? This kind of shape here and this line down the middle. 
but it's a very different looking coral because it almost has these plates going along the side of it rather than those holes. But in all those spaces are where those polyps are going to be living. Excellent. So now that we know what coral is, let's take a look at some animals that live there. Now I'm going to let Sergio pick an animal who lives in the coral reef for us to explore. Let's see what we've got. Excellent. Do you recognize this animal? This, I have to say, is a fan favorite. I love them too. These are our clownfish, or we also like to call them anemone fish. So recognizable name is clownfish, and that is totally fine. But they're also called anemone fish for a couple reasons. One, because there's a bunch of different types of these fish. So we might recognize this one that's got the orange, white, and stripes with the black lining. But they can also come in lots of different sort of color patterns. We have pink anemone fish. I think we've got a picture of one. So check it out. This is also a fish in that same family, but it looks less like the clownfish we recognize. So we call them anemone fish. We also have anemone fish who are black with yellow stripes. We have some that are all orange with one little white stripe. So they come in lots of different sort of color patterns. We also have some here that are some of my favorite. I think they're really cute. They're called skunk anemone fish. And like a skunk, they've got a white stripe that goes down their back. So they're orange with one white stripe kind of going down their back, almost like a mohawk. So we call them anemone fish also because of where they live. If we go back to that other picture of the clownfish, the ones we might recognize, check out all these green and purple things. Kind of look like fingery things. But these are actually anemones. Now we've talked about anemones already, right? We were looking at that big picture of the anemone before. We'll take a look again at the other anemone, the one that we might see here in our local waters or maybe in Northern California. This one specifically is called a fish eating anemone and it's actually found in colder water. So this is one we'll find maybe in like Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska. But we do have anemones here in Southern California. And these are, remember those animals, they have stink cells in these tentacles to catch their food. Now, clownfish, they are a tropical species, right? Because they live on a coral reef. Anemones can be found in all types of water. They're just different types of anemones. So we'll find anemones living in warm tropical waters, like that green one in the clownfish picture. Let's take a look at that fish, that picture again. But the anemones, they all function the same. So even though they live in colder or warmer waters and they're different colors, they all have those stinging cells and those tentacles. But check it out. These anemone fish or the clownfish, they live in and around these anemones. Now think for, pause for a moment. Let's think. We said that the anemones have stinging cells in those tentacles, and that's how they're going to catch the food. Sometimes for anemones, we call them plant-like animals because they kind of look like a plant or a flower, and animals think the same thing. So they swim through thinking they're swimming through a flower, and then that's how the anemone is able to catch their food. So most fish would probably avoid living in an anemone, but check it out. These are called Clark's anemone fish. They're just a type of clownfish, anemone fish. And look at them moving in and out of that anemone. Now, does it look like they're being stung by this animal? Not really. It looks like they're enjoying their time moving in and out. And that's because they have a special adaptation. Now, adaptation is another word we use a lot here in Aquarium Online Academy. And what adaptation means, kind of sounds like a big fancy word, but really it's something on an animal's body that helps it survive in its habitat. So if you think about, excellent, look at that, adaptation. It's always good to have that visual of the word. So an adaptation is something on the animal's body that will help it survive. And so these anemone or clownfish who live in and around the anemones, they have something on their body that's going to protect them from that sting of the anemone's tentacles. And so what they have is an extra layer of slime. Now most fish, they do have a layer of slime covering their body. And that slime protects them from diseases. So their slime covers their scales and it protects those scales. But the slime on the anemone fish is thicker and more specialized. So when they swim through the anemone, they don't feel it. And they're able to move freely and safely in and out of that anemone. Now think about why might a fish want to live in an anemone? Now the clownfish knows they won't get stung. But think about how safe would it be to live in something that other animals can't go into, right? So the anemone protects the clownfish, right? Other fish, if they try to swim into the anemone to maybe try and go after a clownfish, they'll probably get stung and it won't be very comfortable. So the clownfish can safely live in the anemone. Now, what the clownfish does for the anemone is it helps clean it up. 
not a lot of animals in the ocean are the cleanest eaters. And so lots of food scraps get left behind and the clownfish will eat away or eat all those uh, food scraps and help keep the anemone clean. So we call it a symbiotic relationship. It's a relationship where they both get something out of it. The clownfish gets safety and protection and the anemone gets basically a vacuum cleaner, someone to help clean up and keep them nice and tidy. So that is just one animal that we find living in the coral reef. Now, they're pretty cool animals, but let's take a look at another animal. Ooh, look at all these fish here. Check out all the colors we see. This is another exhibit that we have here. This is actually one of my favorite exhibits here at the aquarium. It's called Coral Lagoon. And if you visit us, it's the first exhibit when you go into our tropical gallery. And there's just so many different animals. Look, you can even see we've got some of the fish down here, some anemones for them to live in. We've got lots of different fish in here. We've got yellow tangs, those yellow, bright yellow ones. Oh, look at this guy with polka dots. This one right here, this orange fish, that one is called a rabbit fish. So really cool, different animals. But check out this fish. Now, I did say that it was my favorite, but this happens to be one of my favorite fish at the aquarium. This is called a parrot fish. Have you heard of a parrot fish before? Now these fish are all brightly colored. This is a large parrot fish. This is our bicolored parrot fish. It's the largest one we have here, but we do have some smaller parrot fish we'll take a look at in maybe a little bit. But they are called parrot fish for a very specific reason. Any guesses why we might call them a parrot fish? They don't squawk, we don't hear them, but it does have to do with their mouth. So these fish have a specialized mouth where it kind of looks like a parrot's beak. Do we have a close-up picture we can take a look at? Excellent. Now take a look. This is a different type of parrotfish, but look at those chompers. Now it's not a full beak. It's not like a bird's beak, but what it is is actually all their teeth are kind of fused together. And what that means is they're basically all mushed together into one. So if we were to look really, really close, you would actually see all those individual teeth. Oh, we can see their kind of razor sharp teeth here. So we would see all those individual teeth, but they're all kind of melded together to make it look like a beak. Now, what do you think you'd be eating if you have a beak? Soft things or hard things? That's right, hard things. It helps you, it's their adaptation. It's something that helps them survive because they're able to eat something really specialized in their habitat. So these animals, they live in a coral reef. And so they're actually gonna be eating coral. You heard that right. They are gonna be eating those crunchy, hard corals. Like those skeletons we looked at on the document camera, that is what these parrotfish are gonna be eating. Now, they don't actually like the taste or they don't actually want that hard structure. They want that polyp and the algae and all the tissues on the inside. But in order to get to the inside, they have to eat all those crunchy pieces. Oh, I was like, there's nothing happening. Look at these fish moving here. So this is another one of our exhibits. This is called Coral Predators because it's full of animals who are predators to coral. Now this exhibit does have artificial coral because if we put live coral in here, our animals would eat it all and then we'd go through a lot of coral. But I'll explain how we give them food in just a moment. So this is where we find a lot of our parrotfish, including that bicolor parrotfish. Now it looks like our fish are being shy, but if we're patient for a little bit, we'll see some parrotfish and other fish swim through. So they'll use their beak to eat through that coral to munch all that hard structure in order to get to the soft tissues and the squishy things on the inside. Now, then after they eat all that coral, they absorb all the nutrients from the polyp and from the algae. They do have to get rid of that hard structure, but it's already digested in their body. And so when they poop out the coral, what it turns into is all this white sand here. So if you've ever been somewhere tropical, now don't worry if you live here in Southern California, we don't have parrotfish here, but if you live, if you've ever been somewhere tropical and you see those white sandy beaches, a lot of that sand actually comes from parrotfish. Oh, here's our parrotfish right here. Coming to say hi. A lot of that sand comes from parrotfish, basically parrotfish poop. Now I know that sounds kind of gross, but that's how we get our white sandy beaches. And it's actually really important to have a healthy number of these parrotfish in a coral reef because they will often go after, they'll eat some of the really, really fast growing corals. And that means those corals kind of take over and slower growing corals don't have a lot of room to grow. Or they'll eat corals that maybe aren't the healthiest. And so it kind of helps clean it up. So it actually helps keep a balanced coral reef because they're kind of mowing down the corals that are growing fast or that aren't very healthy and making room for other corals to grow. Now, 
I said that we don't have live coral in here for these parrotfish. But what we do, I actually have one here. I'm going to put it on our document camera. I'll find a piece of paper to put it on. So what we use, not this yellow, we use this block right here. Now what this block is, it's made of plaster of Paris. It's kind of like, almost like a really soft concrete. Now concrete we know is really hard. So this is much softer. It's almost like got a chalky feeling to it. But we make these blocks. And this makeup of what makes up this block is pretty similar to what makes up coral. And when we mix these blocks up, so this one doesn't have any, but when we mix these blocks up, we'll actually put algaes and nutrients into it so that the parent fish will eat this block and they'll get all the nutrients they need to help keep them healthy, help them grow. And it helps sharpen their beak, right? Because they're kind of eating this hard structure. And that way they're not going after the coral in our exhibit. So this is exactly what we'll put in there. Sometimes if you come visit the aquarium, you'll see a couple of these down on the bottom of the exhibit and you'll see the animals picking at it. And that's because that is their food source. So we mix their food into these squares. We put them in there and let them pick at it to get their food. All right, let's go back to coral predators. Ooh, excellent. So this is another one of our coral reef habitats, but this is a good one to point out because coral predators, as I mentioned, are animals who eat coral, and parrotfish are one of those animals, but in this uh, image or this video, which is of another exhibit, we have another predator of coral. Now, you may not notice it. It kind of gets lost or hidden, but this thing right here is called a crown of thorn sea star. It's a type of sea star, and as its name kind of implies, it almost looks like it's got these crowns of thorns on its body. But crown of thorn sea stars are also known to eat coral. Now, they are another predator, but unlike parrotfish, who just kind of munch and munch and they'll eat when they need to and they'll kind of help clean it up, these guys, the crown of thorns, they can mow down a coral reef. They can eat really, really fast. They can eat a ton of coral and they can move really fast. So it's important for us to have a couple of crown of thorns in a habitat, but not too many. Now the problem happens is these sea stars, they actually thrive off of pollutants. So think about things that go into the ocean that aren't healthy for the ocean can affect a lot of animals, but for some animals, it actually makes them stronger, which sounds kind of wild. But the crown of thorn actually, they tend to grow a lot more if there's pollutants put into the ocean. And so if we're polluting our ocean, their population increases which then causes a decrease in the population of our corals. So we do want to have a couple of them because like the parrotfish, they kind of help clean things up. But if we have too many, it can cause a lot of destruction. So they're a really cool, interesting animal, important for us to have, but we like to have a balance of those predators. I want to go back to the parrotfish. One last thing, because there's some really cool things about this animal that we didn't quite get to. I know it's already really cool how they eat corals and then they poop it out and they give us those white sandy beaches like we see here. But there's one other really cool thing about parrotfish, and that is how they sleep. Now, a lot of times we do get the question here at the aquarium of how do fish sleep? And they sleep in a really interesting way. Now, there's a couple different ways fish will sleep, but most of them will actually just shut down half of their brain or one side of their body and let that side rest while the other side is alert, is looking around for predators, and is also breathing so that they can stay alive. And then they'll switch off back and forth. And that's how a lot of fish, sharks, and even things like dolphins and whales will sleep that way as well. The parrotfish, however, the parrotfish likes to be nice and cozy in a sleeping bag. You heard that right. They will make their own sleeping bag. Now, it's kind of a gross sleeping bag because it is made out of mucus. So think about, we talked about how the clownfish has that thick layer of mucus or slime on its body. The parrotfish can make this really thick mucus. It comes out of its mouth, and they actually cover themselves and make a little bubble for when they sleep. Now, why do you think an animal would want to sleep in a sleeping bag? Now think about, we sleep in a sleeping bag to keep us warm, right? If you're camping or you're at a sleepover, it's your blanket and it keeps you nice and cozy. Our fish, they don't need to worry about that. The water is warm. They don't need to worry about staying nice and cozy. But there are predators around. And there's things called parasites, which are kind of like little bugs that might try and attach to a fish and they can be harmful. And so what the parrotfish does when they sleep is they cover themselves in that bubble of mucus and that protects their body and it protects their scent. So no parasites can smell them while the fish is sleeping and they're able to stay nice and safe. So the parrotfish not only eats coral and poops out coral, making white sandy beaches, they actually make a sleeping bag out of mucus and that's how they sleep. And then every morning they kind of tear out of that sleeping bag and then they move about their day and then the next night they build that same sleeping bag.
Now, here at the aquarium, we don't think that our parrotfish actually make that mucus sleeping bag. We used to have sleepovers here where we'd have school groups come and spend the night, and we always talked about going to watch our parrotfish to see if they made that mucus sleeping bag, but we never saw it happen. And we think that because they are in a clean environment, there are no threat of parasites or any predators, that they don't really need to make that sleeping bag. Imagine making this full bubble of mucus on your body every night. Ooh, look at this. There it is. How cool is that? But think about making this every night, it takes a lot of energy. So if you don't need to do it, you're most likely not going to do it. So we don't think our parrotfish do it here, but it is a pretty cool thing about these animals. All right, everyone, we are out of time, but there are so many more things you can learn about a coral reef. You can make more observations by watching our webcam. You can do research on your own, or you can join us another time when we talk about coral reefs or another habitat here. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.